uh, my name is Kelly Dunna. I have a master's degree in clinical psychology, and I'm currently pursuing my PsyD, or my doctorate in clinical psychology as well. And my favorite video game is Halo. All of them. Hi, I'm Dr. Sexton. I have a PhD in social science from the University of Thoreau, UMass Amherst. Um, PhD in clinical psych um, from American University. I've uh, worked for a variety of places, NIH, NIMH, SAMHSA, CDC, National Census, um, FBI, so I'm the stats guy. Yep. And what's your favorite video game? What's, what's your favorite video game? Oh, my favorite video game? Um, Civilization and, <laughs> <laughs> and anything that has Star Wars on it, I'm sad to say. All right, all right. So we're gonna go ahead and switch on over to our other play, play sledge. Yay, so just in case you missed it, there, is our, there are our names and our lovely degrees and the title of the panel, just in case you forgot it already. If so, go see a neuropsychologist. <laughs> that is not us. All right, so we're gonna start off with some myth busting, because that's what we do when we do science, is we bust myths. So looking at this lovely bell-shaped curve here, and a nice standard deviation going on. So just kind of a polling of the audience. When you're looking at openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, which I will break down for you, start thinking about where you think the average gamer falls. Just wherever, you know, you might think. So openness, but it's openness to new experience, willing to try new things. You know, think about where, where do you guys think they fall? The red, the orange, or the yellow? Red, raise your hand. The low side. Anybody on the low side? On openness, okay. What about orange? Anybody think they're right in the middle on orange? All right, well, a lot of people. And uh, on the gold side, they're more open than everybody else? Okay, <laughs> don't cheat. <laughs> All right, conscientiousness, being aware of others, of others' feelings and how your behaviors and thoughts and words can impact how others may think, behave, and feel. Where do you think gamers fall, red, lower? Wow, you guys are pessimistic. <laughs> orange, right in the middle? And gold, better than everybody else on conscientiousness. <laughs> All right, what about extroversion? I think that one's pretty much self-explanatory, being extroverted, outgoing. Red? Okay. Orange? All right, and yellow. Wow, not, okay. We tend to be more, a little more controlled there. And then agreeableness, again, pretty self-explanatory. How well you get along with others, being nice to others, being kind, not contradictory or confrontational. Red? Okay, you guys think that gamers are nasty. <laughs> Orange, normal. Okay. And gold, they're just, they're just so super nice to everybody. All right, and the last one, neuroticism. So, whoa, okay, <laughs> easy there. <laughs> All right, so neuroticism being uh, vulnerability to experiencing really intense emotions like anxiety and depression. So red would be, they are more vulnerable to it. They're more likely to get anxious or more likely to get clinically depressed. Okay, well, pretty good number. In the middle, they're about normal, average. Okay, and then gold, they are superheroes and they feel no pain. Yeah, there we go. All right, so now remember, I'm using the honor system here, so um, remember what you said, and here are the actual results that we have found in our study. Look at all that, you guys are normal. That's good, right? Except for O, which is openness. So gamers do tend to be more open to new experiences than the normal or uh, our norms would say, which makes a lot of sense because if you have to keep up to date with consoles and new games and new technology, you've got to be pretty willing to be open to new experiences. But everything else, you know, uh, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, you guys are all normal. And I, I think that's something, something we hear very often. You know, we're told a lot of different things. If you guys saw the, the real playing, all those media headlines, um, blaming gamers for a lot of things. So rest assured, you're, you most likely are normal. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say everybody, I can't, I can't do that. So there are three main topics that come up uh, when we discuss mental health and video games. And the three most common are addiction. I think there was a panel on it. <laughs> what is with the giggling? Are we identifying a little too much here? Some projection, maybe? I don't know. Um, so addiction, there was, actually, there was actually a panel on this yesterday. I think there's one after this panel tonight as well. 
So, you know, we're not going to delve into addiction too much, but that's what you hear a lot about. Video games are addicted. They're taking our children, and it's just like gambling. It's just like alcohol. It's bad for you. Violence. This is a really serious one um, since Columbine up to the latest one in, uh, in Connecticut. And if there's been another one since, I'm not quite sure. But, you know, stabbed at Grand Theft Auto Q, and, you know, kids are going crazy with violence. Video games are bad for you because they make you violent. There's a lot of stuff out there right now, especially in the media. So that's something that comes up a lot when we talk about mental health and video games. And look, go back. Stop it. See, I'm getting aggressive here. There we go. So play video games. So stereotypes. There's a big, big problem with stereotypes in video games, whether it's, you know, super masculine and damsel in distress, or video games are just for children, which we know is not true, which we will get into. Um, so there's a lot of stereotypes surrounding video games and the people who play them. Hi. <laughs> so we're going to address addiction first. And again, I know there's been other panels on it, so I'm going to go over it really, really quick. Uh, one of the, the big studies was by Gentile in 2009, and he basically said 8% of the youth, 18 to 8 years old, are addicted to video games, just like you were addicted to alcohol or crack or something. And this is really bad, and it's only going to get worse throughout your lifetime. So these really awesome people in Australia did this study of adults, because we all know that there's a big cognitive difference between children and adults, and that's what this panel is focusing on is adults. And what they did is they assessed for adults with problematic gaming habits. So they play too much, they neglect their work, they neglect their spouse or significant other. Just things like that might happen, problematic gaming. And they got split into two groups. So two people who endorse problematic gaming, which is that top dotted line, and people who did not endorse problematic gaming, which is that bottom line. And they tracked them over 18 months, so a longitudinal study, a long time. And what they found is that everybody ex experienced a decrease in problematic gaming symptoms. So even the worst, the people who were reporting the worst symptoms, got better over time. And they really didn't have an explanation for it. I mean, it could be maturity. You know, that's almost two years. Maybe you've matured. What else has changed in your life? But it, it just kind of goes to show that just because you might have, even if you have a gaming problem, the chances are very likely that it's going to decrease over time. You're not stuck with it, and it's not increasing, if nothing else, which is a really good sign for those who uh, emphasize video game addiction and it's... it's deadliness or whatever. So the violent video game debate. This one's really fun. Um, so on one side you have Craig Anderson, and he has written a lot about, he's pro if you've read an article about how violent, violent video games make kids more violent, he probably either wrote it or had a hand in writing it. So he is like the violent video games are bad for you guy. And he's actually quoted as saying that video games are a public health threat for individuals from uh, children, so like eight years old, up to stu students college age, so in their 20s. So that's what he says, that's what his research indicates, and that's what he's putting, putting out there. Now on the other side of the Mortal Kombat scene here is uh, Christopher Ferguson. And if you've read anything that says video games are not necessarily bad for you, he's probably had a hand in writing it as well. And he's replicated a lot of Anderson studies and has found no correlation. And even when he does find correlations, he points out that correlations do not imply causation. Basically, just because there is a direction, it doesn't mean that it caused it. Just because you know, someone goes and shoots up a school and they happen to play Call of Duty, it doesn't mean that Call of Duty caused that to happen. So you can't, you can't imply causation in that way. So thus he refutes Anderson. And they've been going back and forth for a while. Anderson has been writing this stuff since the 80s. And Ferguson has come in the 2000s to kind of counterbalance it. So that's kind of a summary of the violent video game debate that's going on. For gamer stereotypes, uh, hopefully this isn't too surprising for everybody out there, but females comprise 47% of the gaming population. Yeah, ladies! Woo! Yeah! We are in that house. We are going for parody. And, you know, the, the average age of somebody who buys a uh, video game is 35. The average age of a gamer is 30. We are not, you know, little boys with acne problems living in our parents' basements playing video games by ourselves. I think that's a lot of the misconceptions that's out there. Or you're 30-something living in your parents' basement by yourself. Um, <laughs> it kind of goes both ways. So there's just a lot of information out there uh, that just isn't true. And part of dealing with mental health is getting rid of that stigma, getting rid of the thoughts that video games are for children, or they're useless, or they're a waste of time, or they're bad for you, or they're dangerous. So just kind of getting to know, you know, who's buying the games. And this actually comes from the ESAs, Essential Facts About Video Games. And I highly recommend that. They put it out every single year. So if you want some really good facts about who's playing and what they're playing, 
this is really the place to go. So again, what we did, uh, this research is from my dissertation that I'm currently working on. And so the method is just kind of how we all put it together. And we'll get to why this is really important, because I don't want anybody's eyes to glass over quite yet. I know when I see dissertation method, I'm like, oh my god. But I promise it's worth it, so just hang with me. All right, so step one was we recruited real gamers. And that may sound stupid, but I promise you it's very important. And you'd be very surprised about some of these studies that are put out and who their gamers are. So for our study, we actually went to gaming websites and actually recruited real gamers. So we went to Rooster Teeth. Anybody Rooster Teeth fan? <laughs> went to Griff Ball Hub. Yeah! Woo! And the PMS clan, because we wanted to make sure that the lead, yeah, there we go, one, <laughs> one right there. Um, oh, another one, I thought I saw one. Yeah, there we go. So we wanted to make sure that the ladies were included as well, because another problem with the literature is that there are either no women or there's like five. And you can't really do any fun stats with five. You can't, no. So then we collected data. We made people take a really, really long survey that had a lot of information on there about demographics, play habits, play styles, and fun stuff like depression, anxiety, personality, all sorts of fun stuff. And then we waited 30 days, and we did it again. So you got to take this really long survey twice. And oh, I forgot the little raptor icon there. That's another thing that made our study very, very unique. And to date, I think it's the only one to have done this, is that we used raptor data to track how long people played and what they played. And again, I'll get to the significance of that in just a second. And then step five, we, Anna, we did science. <laughs> we made lots of shiny graphs and did science, and it was fantastic. So just as a quick recap, get gamers, assess them for mental health symptoms, wait. Reassess mental health symptoms, record the hours they play during that 30-day period, and then do science. 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 So what? So what is, what's the big deal? Why do we care about all of this research methodology? Why is it not that interesting? Um, for one, like I said, we had real gamers. In a lot of literature out there, no matter who's writing it, they use a lot of convenient samples. Anybody familiar with that term, convenient samples? We have a couple psychology people in the house? Yeah. So basically, what a lot of times they'll do is they'll go to college campuses and say, hey, you're taking Psych 101, you want extra credit? Come take this research study. And do you play video games? No? Oh, well, that's, you know, that's, that's fine. So you're getting people who may, might have never have played or play just console, and they're having you play on PC or vice versa, and you really don't know what their experience is. So are they really gamers, or are they people just being popped into a situation they've never played before? Has anybody played a game that they couldn't figure out the control settings on? How, okay, very, very psych psychology question. How did that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, playing Lost Planet, Rage Face. Those controls were awful, awful. So, you know, that's something to keep in consideration. So we used real gamers on, and we had a natural observation versus a laboratory. Imagine you're sat down to play Grand Theft Auto in a lab with someone like us two leaning over your shoulders in white lab coats with clipboards. How do you think you're gonna play? Yeah, or right, one really excited, we'll sign him up right away. I'm gonna play violent. You're gonna play violent? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you might be doing it to show you think I'm violent. You haven't seen violent yet. <laughs> so, what Raptor allowed us to do is we were able to watch, watch, not really, that would be creepy, but we were able to observe gaming habits, your controller, on your TV, on your schedule, on your console, with your games, on, and your habits. So, we're really observing you, you and your natural habitat, like Steve Irwin. We're just out there. Oh, you're pretty legal. No, I no, I don't do. Okay, that wasn't Australian at all. So sorry. So that's another big thing is that nobody else has ever done that because when you collect data like this, you have to be in there or at least around them. And the average time for playing. To, can we get a guess? How long do you think gamers were allowed to play in these laboratory settings? Half hour. Do I hear higher, lower? Half hour, half hour, half hour. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Do I hear ten minutes? Fifteen minutes. Yep. About average time is about 15 minutes to let people play. Yeah, how can you play that? If you pull me off a of halo after 15 minutes, I'm gonna be a little angry too. My aggression levels are gonna be a little high. Because I'm not done yet. I've got I got flood to kill. So that is what is so different about this study, and that's why we really wanted to present on it, because it's real gamers in their real habitats doing what real gamers do, not some abstract sample or some kind of laboratory um, experiment. So this is what we found. Okay, so the first question is, are you crazy? <laughs> That's a valid question. We want to know. We want to know. 
Um, what we found is that pathology actually does not predict actual gain, which on average in the sample is two hours a day. So it may sound like a lot, but if you think about it, people do a lot of things for entertainment two hours out of the day, like watch TV. So, um, it, so it, when you're looking at this, um, the green ones are how much, we first ask how much do you expect that you'll be playing per week, and then we look at how much you actually play. And in terms of um, symptoms of depression, and if you're into this, the BDI. Um, anxiety, if you're into it, the STAI. Uh, state anger, STAXI. Trait anger, STAXI. Those are the measures if you're into this. Um, what we found is the only thing that really predicts um, is what you expect to play. And so um, people who are depressed and people who have a lot of trait anger, that means like enduring over years, um, they expect to play more, but they don't. <laughs> Ta da! So, are you guys crazy? No. The more you play, the crazier you are? No. So, there actually isn't any real connection. Um, so, it does predict expected gaming. It's what we call a small effect. Um, that's another thing to watch out for the, in these studies. Sometimes they're like, oh, there's this huge connection. We explain 1% of the variance. <laughs> but you can get significance that way. So it's good to uh, identify what are small, medium, and large. And so these are both small effects. So, Oh, one thing to keep in mind, sorry about the last slide. It's important whenever you're looking at the research. There's something we call negative mood state processing bias. People who are constantly depressed or constantly angry don't really see the world accurately. And so if you ask them, what do you do? or what are you going to do, they don't report accurately. So if you're looking at research that seems to draw a connection between these two things, they may just be both of the things that they're reporting are coming from the pathology. It's not actual reality. So they say, oh, there's a connection between this and that. No, they're just biased reporting. So, cool, thanks. So we want to know if your beliefs about your gaming habits uh, predict whether or not you, were, you would game. And we looked at three different things. First is, um, are you playing video games instead of going to a therapist? Are you using video games as a type of therapy? And this isn't um, something that's totally bizarre. There's something also called retail therapy, <laughs> where I feel bad and I'm gonna go buy something and I'll feel better. And I know I feel better after a good haircut, so I'm not dismissing this at all. But chocolate. The chocolate is another chocolate therapy. So. Um, uh, people report they play video games to reveal, ah, sorry, uh, relieve feelings of anxiety or depression. And then at the other ones, um, socializing. Are you socializing because you think video games are a great way to get to know people? Versus, on the other end of the scale is, video games are one of my main social activities. And there's a difference. One is, you know what, I game and I meet people. It's a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the positive end of the scale. The negative end of the scale is kind of a sense of, this is my only recourse. And so it kind of makes sense when you think about it. If you think, this is the only way I can do it, that might be a negative end of the scale of using things. Imagine the forever alone meme. That would be this end of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. So the, the last one is relaxation versus uh, losing yourself. And so relaxation side is video games relax me. Um, the negative side is I tend to lose track of time when playing video games, and honestly, I do. So yeah. I love the fact that Civilization has a timer thing on it where it kicks you out. <laughs> but the thing, the extent of it is what's really important. If this is a moderate level thing, it's not a big deal. But when it gets to be extreme, when you've been sitting there and you wake up and it's hours and hours later and this is a chronic thing and you haven't done anything to really get away from that, when you're going in to lose yourself, you want to lose yourself, it's the happiest time of your life, and you're drag kicking and screaming away from it. And that's kind of the negative end of the scale. So. And so in this, it's kind of the same thing. Um, in terms of expect to play, you can see that um, gaming is treatment. If you're using it as treatment, you want the treatment, you tend to play more. In terms of um, being social, it's not really a, it's what we call a, a trivial effect, and it's in the negative direction. And in terms of relaxing versus losing yourself, if you'd like to relax playing video games, then you tend to play a lot more. And that is actually the only one connected to whether you actually play more. So the other two, again, they're kind of an illusion. But if you relax to play, then you do actually tend to play more. 
So gaming causes pathology. So we track people over a month to see how much they game, and then we checked in with them at the very end to see, did you get sicker? Did you get crazier? No. <laughs> Ta-da. So, and we had a pretty decent size sample, so we could have picked up little things. Nothing. So there you go. If you play a shooter, and shooters make all the, all the uh, news and everything, it actually reduced your anxiety. <laughs> so, you know, you stress out, you have a bad day, you play a shooter, you feel better. Over the month, you're feeling better. So there you go. If you play Civilization or something else other than a shooter, guess what? So your state anger actually went up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a state is just a transitory one, not trait. So, but and it's still below average. So. And just for um, I just disclaimer, this was collected before SimCity came out, so <laughs> that does not have an effect on our sample. <laughs> we, we aren't able to answer that question at this time. It needs more research. So in terms of uh, your beliefs, why you're a game, how those had an influence on things, um, if you're using them, um, if you're seeing them at games as a good place to meet people, guess what? It actually reduces your depression. So if you think, you know what, this is, like a, this is another part of my social life, and it's a way that I meet people, it actually works. People talk a lot about the virtual world as if it's fake. That's not necessarily true. The social connections that you make there, and there have been studies that show that look at people and examine people and show that the way that they respond to people online is actually very similar. And so it can be a good thing. In terms of um, your uh, state anger, it actually drops it. So. In terms of um, relaxing or losing yourself, um, the more you use it for relaxation, guess what? The less anxiety you feel. So that works too. Games as treatment, it doesn't work. Mm -mm. So just as a note, if you're trying to reduce your feelings of depression, reduce your feelings of anxiety by using video games, I haven't found it to work. So. And that's, that's clinical levels, right? Um, actually, we're looking at just symptoms overall. So oh. in terms of looking at clinical levels or not, the number of people who play video games who are crazy yeah. is not enough for us to really have good power to pick up anything aside from large effects. So there were probably some small effects, but we couldn't claim significance, so we couldn't claim that they were totally different. So this is like symptoms overall. So even if you're just bouncing around at the subclinical level, and maybe you're at risk for further depression. So. In a way, it's actually more impressive that we found some things there, because there's a floor effect, so we don't really have a whole lot of way to go, but we still did find effects. Mm -hmm. So in terms of causality, um, people talk a lot about correlation, um, not meaning causation. Gaming and beliefs uh, were measured before we measured the changes, so it's unlikely that's the reverse. It's unlikely that you kind of look back in time and be like, oh, well, I'm going to change my gaming habits because I got more anxious. So causality probably doesn't run the other direction. Um, people who do worse initially report a concern over how they use games. Um, so. If you're using games in a negative fashion, then you are more likely to suffer. So that includes um, using it for treatment. Um, you can't get games outside of, or sorry, you can't get games outside of friends. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get friends outside of games. Or if you're getting involuntary lost. I mean, these are some pretty bad signs. If you're on the flip side of those scales, that's great. So remember, it is a continuum. And um, are these beliefs accurate, or are they internalized uh, gamophobia? This is something we can't answer. It's a fundamental question here. And so these beliefs tend to lead to um, better or worse outcomes. And why are those beliefs leading to better or worse outcomes? Is it because um, these perceptions you have about why you game are accurate, and they are accurate and so they predict further pathology? Or is it internalized gamophobia? So the extent that you game a lot and people say, oh, well, you just game because you need to get friends, or oh, you just game because you, know, you want to escape the world. Is it people wearing down on you? Is it them treating you, sorry, teaching you to fear yourself, to fear your activities, to look at your behavior and view your behavior as pathology? That's a possibility here and one that we can't rule out. 
So are you facing a lot of pressure and stress because you game, and that's leading to the negative outcomes? Or is it because you're using games in an unhealthy way, and that's leading to the negative outcomes? We really can't answer that. And um, with that in mind, as a clinical psychologist, I have to wonder, to what extent would changing your perspectives on your game help? If this is what we call a framing issue, how you understand your behavior is what leads to pathology, then it's my goal as a clinical psychologist to get you to understand that gaming isn't sick, that if you find friends through gaming, that doesn't make you pathetic, it makes you human, and it's a great thing. So, so do we need to change the frame? Is that getting lost? If I, like I get lost, but I like set you know, an alarm on my phone or in civilization, I tell it, hey, kick me out at this point. If I manage it in an appropriate way, is that getting lost? Is that really leading to pathology? Or is it when I tell people I get lost and they go, oh, wow, you get lost. What kind of maniac are you? Is that what's leading to the problem? We don't really know. So, Likewise, to what extent would changing gaming versus non-gaming behavior help? So do we need to use this research to encourage people to seek other social outlets, to use the gaming as a different social outlet? Um, do we need to uh, basically do the stuff the time thing? It's like if you get lost, it's a problem. OK, we'll set a little stopwatch. When the alarm goes off, then you have to stop. Is that what we need to do? So this research has answered a lot of questions, but it's also raised a lot of interesting ones. So conclusions for gamers, for all of you who are gamers. You're not crazy. There we go. Yay! Yay! That's the good news. The bad news is what it really is saying is you're not crazier than everyone else. Just <laughs> um, also, playing games will not make you crazy all by themselves. So don't look at the number of hours that you play and think, oh, this is going to drive me mad. That's not necessarily true. Um, it's the way that you use them, we think. They can be a great place to find friends if it's your only way. And it may just be as if, it, if it's your perception that's your only way, but that's kind of going off into a tangent. If it's your only way, that might be a problem. So there's the people who strongly endorse, endorse that it was their main way. Um, they can be a great way to relax. I know I use it this way all the time. Mm -hmm. If you're getting lost, that might be a sign that something might be going wrong. So if you are getting lost, you know, have someone help you out with that. Set some sort of thing like an alarm clock. Um, most importantly though, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a clinical psychologist, <laughs> they do not replace therapy. <laughs> if you need help, you should get it. So, and actually, um, we do other research on clinical efficacy, and in terms of uh, talk therapy, it's actually been shown to be better and more long-lasting than drugs. So finding yeah. someone, and there was a great presentation the other day by a gaming affirmative therapist, but finding someone that you can talk to about any issues or feelings that you might have can actually help a great deal. So. If you were a designer, are there any designers in here? Yeah, all right. Cool. Some designers. Um, we don't know if you're not crazy or not. <laughs> <laughs> so just so you know, your consumers aren't crazy, and what you're doing isn't driving them crazy. So that might be a little bit of a load off. Um, people do buy your games to meet these needs. So that's something important to keep in mind. The extent that you can address these needs would be fantastic, um, such as getting lost, Facilitating positive socialization. And I know I've been playing games for a couple of decades now, I have to admit. And I have seen the social aspect just blossom. Mm -hmm. And it's been fantastic. I think from a mental health perspective, but also I think the extent that people meet this in a positive way really kind of um, encourages sales, let's be honest. So are there treatment-oriented games? This is actually a developing field. And um, it's a niche market. There actually aren't that many crazy gamers out there. But um, treatment-oriented oriented games, I think, are very promising in the future. And I know Kelly has a lot of great ideas along those lines. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot of really great games out there. I know there's one, I think it's being developed in Sweden. It does CBT, so Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Children. And you're a pirate ship, and it shoots automatic thoughts out of cannon. And you have to snatch out the bad thoughts and leave the good thoughts there. So that's one of the ones that are out there. Uh, Jane McGonigal, if anybody's familiar with her, she's got a ton of games 
from you know, changing the world through oil, um, environmental things, as far as mental health. Uh, I actually work with veterans at a VA in Washington, D.C., and I've impl implemented game theory to help my veterans do their homework. And we call them weekly challenges, and they level up, and it's really cool, and they, they really enjoy it. Um, so, but there is kind of a problem right now where a lot of game developers don't want to create, um, I think, what's that horrible word they call it? Educational? No, not education. What, there's a term for it. Edutainment, thank you. So games that are just about, you know, that kind of thing. But, I mean, everybody remembers Oregon Trail, right? Yeah. 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 Everybody remembers the Big Blue River. I know I do. I sunk there every time. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there are games out there that are a model. And I, I think if, you know, on these, these two sides, the educational side, the mental health side, and the gaming side, they really need to get together and have a, a conversation. Because a lot of educational sides, they just want it to be a straight educational game, which is great, but that's not what gamers necessarily want. You know, there's, there's that gaming aspect that has to be prevalent for people to want to play it. I mean, Number of Crunchers is great, but after a while it gets a little old, especially after you learn your times tables. So, um, you know, it, it is a niche market, and it, it is growing. So if you have any good ideas, make sure that you go to a developer and let them know. And if you're a developer, you know, we have a you know, PhD squared and a hopefully soon PsyD here that would be lovely to talk to you. Loving it. So just throwing that out there. So um, we're going to have a Q&A section. We have some people, um, our lovely enforcers here, have the microphone, and they're going to pass it around so that nobody trips and falls, just like Dusty. He's in the front row here. Thank you, Dusty. So if you have, uh, if you have a question, please feel free. I guess um, raise your hand or stand up or I guess, well, how, how would you like to do it? Okay. Uh, Vanellope. I want to start with Vanellope right here. I would have liked to go longer. I would have loved to do it at like 30 day intervals over a longer period of time. However, it's a dissertation and I want to graduate um, <laughs> sometime in the near future. So it's, it's kind of one of those things where I think it gives a lot of really good information, especially considering all the unique aspects, you know, the raptor tracking hours, the observational, the non-convenient sample, using real gamers. And I think it's really set me up for future research to dig into exactly that question. Uh, and it was 15 minutes. In a typical experiment versus a month. So, and we did look at things six months later. We didn't look at a pathology, but we did look at gaming six months later. And it was actually remarkably consistent. Mm -hmm. so. Would it be okay to have them like, line up? Because I feel bad picking. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, there's some of my own insecurities coming out here. <laughs> All right. um, there's a lot of debate going on right now about guns. Yeah. And um, here's Sean and Pierre the other day. Where there's so many last times I thought where, you know, people say guns don't kill people. Um, but he did make the point that it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. And um, and so I'm just asking if you're doing any research about video games um, in that light. Because you're talking about people either using them this way or using them that way or whatever. But, you know... Um, Maybe people could use some information or right. some help because maybe they make it a lot easier to do some of those things. Sure, I and mean, there's, there's two main points on it. That's a great question. There's two main points. One, just because you play Halo or Call of Duty does not mean you have any clue how to load or handle a gun. I mean, <laughs> and, I mean it, if you've never handled a weapon, if you've never received any kind of training from either a family member, a sibling, or anything like that, I can guarantee you, I've done weapons training, I had no idea how to do anything with it, other than, um, yeah. I actually wasn't talking about the connection between video games and mental health. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. I was talking about the connection between video games and mental health, like, if video games make it easier to lose yourself, make it easier to, you know, some of those things we're saying that weren't healthy. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. I'm sorry. Did you? Oh, just, you know what I mean? Just to make that look yeah, good. yeah. So. Did you want to grab that one? No. In a lot of media, actually, why she was responding to that, in a lot of media, it talks about it in terms of behavioral facilitation, meaning it kind of teaches you and trains you and models for you the proper behaviors. And as she's pointed out, the real behaviors involved actually don't really match up with video games very well. So, in terms of it training you to carry out these acts, um, but not a great trainer. I mean, the Army uses trainers that are far superior. 
Um, but in terms of uh, the mental health aspect, um, we didn't see any changes at all in trade anger. And the state anger changes actually came from the more benign, non-shooter, well, what they consider benign, uh, non-shooter games. And it was just state anger. And the important thing to keep in mind is even though we saw, we saw increases, it was still far below the average person. So I have been walking around this conference. Y'all are very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, I mean, I also go to football games. <laughs> and that's actually a really interesting point. There is a, an article, I think his name is Adachi, and he actually ran a study to see whether um, it was, like in video games and mental health, it was actually competition and not the, the violence of the video game that predicted whether people would experience anger and hostility and those more negative emotions. And he did find that it was competition, not the game itself, which I think is a great example with, with the, in real life football. So does that answer your question? Okay, yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was curious about the data that you had in the beginning uh, in the introduction, uh, how you operationalize the term gamer, and, and more on that, how is that, how is a gamer you, you know, how is the, the, the term gamer usually defined in studies? Because there's a huge difference, in my opinion, between someone who plays, you know, who you could call a hardcore gamer or someone who played, who's played the dual bit list three times. So. <laughs> You can call them both gamers, but right. I think that makes a huge difference. I'm wondering how people tend to operate and how you guys did in that first, the first set of data. Well, in the literature, they're often referred to as people who played video games. So that's how they oper operationalize it. Have you played Bejeweled once, or are you an MLG player? They don't typically break it down. Some studies do. I don't want, I don't want to knock everybody. But a lot of the times, it's just you know, subject engaged in video game play, therefore it made them a video gamer. For us, we went to sites that are known for gamers. It's what they do, it's what they live and what they breathe. And we didn't really have to operationalize it so much because we really looked at the hours they played. And that's kind of, you know, we looked to see, is there consistency or did you just play one hour in the last month? You know, and that, you know, wasn't quite as impressive. But everybody, I think, was pretty... I mean, two, two hours a day was average, right? Yeah, and we actually wanted people who didn't play a lot because, you know, in order to make a comparison, we need the people who, you know, may have been uh, contacted through these means but actually don't really play a whole lot. And we needed people who played, and I think there were somewhere like 200 hours or so in a month. We needed those people. We needed the whole range. So. Okay, yeah. Um, did you study at all in food? Because like, I noticed you did stuff about anxiety, like... Um, Games specifically geared for raising your anxiety, like um, high difficulty games like Battletoads, or <laughs> <laughs> or uh, even games that have glitches that make you so you can't actually beat it, like for instance, Fire Rush on the top of my head, or maybe do Sim City, for instance. <laughs> uh, well, this came up before Sim City, so thankfully, otherwise our state anger would be much higher. We didn't, we just, we really wanted to see what people played in their natural environment. We wanted to see what people would play when they were given free reign on their schedule to play whatever they wanted. So whether or not the, the frustration level of a game is something really hard to kind of capture, or horror games like Fear, ones that are supposed to raise your anxiety level. Um, I don't remember coding for any horror games, but I, I, you can't quote me 100% on that. Most of them, the vast majority, were Mass Effect 3, Borderlands 2, and Halo. Those were the, the big three that we had. And we had a couple puzzles, a couple fighters, and a couple um, brawler, not brawlers. Um, I'm forgetting one of them, but that's okay. But as far as ones that intentionally raise your anxiety level, if there were any, I don't even remember them. So there probably wouldn't have been that big of an effect. But that would be really interesting to see what would happen if you had people play games like that. Uh, so, from your data and from a whole lot of what you've been studying, you've been, you show that video games really don't should have this huge connection to what the media portrays. Um, so, I was wondering, has, is there research that is going into making games that actually target those type of effects? Like, not just positive ones, because I know education is great, but that's a huge thing right now, but mm -hmm. also negative ones. Are, are, there are developers out there that are actively trying to see what will, uh, can I make a game that will make someone incredibly angry to the point of, you know, clinical anger compared to uh, 
what people would have been doing because they want to you know, make a shooter or they want to make a quick sort or something like that. Um, I can't particularly think of a specific game designer out there that's out to piss people off other than SimCity and EA. I'm um, going back to that. The only thought I can really think of is that one Japanese game that's banned in the US because you go around trying to, I don't want to use the triggering R word, um, but sexually assaulting women. Um, that's the only one I could think of where it would definitely um, raise that. I mean, for me, it would piss me way off. Um, I'd be off the deep end with that one. But as far as game developers with the mission of going out and pissing people off to make them do bad things. Not that I'm aware of, because if you do that, then your person's going to jail and they're not going to buy your next game. So you know, it's kind of counterproductive, right? Sure. Quick question. Well, two-part two question. For your Raptor program, did it cover data from say, Kong Soul to Raptor Two? And what was the performance like you know, being here at PAX with yeah. And did it cover the like that's military to go to TDY or the week when I'm here, I'm obviously on the console. Mm -hmm. So did it cover mediation for those? It didn't cover tablet or mobile because Raptor just can't cover that. It can cover PS3. I think it covered uh, 360 definitely. Con uh, computer, because that's a big one too. And maybe DS. I'm not sure if it was Wi-Fi connected. But as far as mobile and tablet, Raptor doesn't have that capability. Not that I was made aware of anyway. And as far as um, when being deployed or TDY, if you could log in on your gamer tag or PSN ID, then it would track it. But if you weren't using that, then there was no way for us to be able to log those hours. So it's not perfect by any means. I mean, I mean, we're not we're not saying that this is you know the answer, but it is just a different take on it because you're not in a lab. Uh, what's the name of the CDT game? You know. I, th that? I think it's called like Treasure Hunt. I, I can look it up for you. If you want to come up, to, up here after the panel, I can look it up for you. I have it on my phone somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's a pirate ship in CBT. I don't think it's out yet, though. They're still in development, but it's coming soon. Okay. <laughs> oh, of, yeah. I mean, well, I got to check. Those are your graphs. <laughs> sure. All right. Yeah. Nice. Sure. sure. So, uh, one of the last guys pretty much asked the first one of question. Okay. But, um, so, you said you're able to uh, keep track of like, PC gamers separately and all that kind of stuff. Um, I guess it's kind of two part now. Um, did you find any like notable differences between like, PS3, 360, and PC? <laughs> or um, did you find, I know you said uh, that shooter and non shooter, you know, non shooters had a slight increase in anger. Did you go more in depth about? Well, I can handle the console part of that. There weren't really a whole lot of PC gamers, so I'm going to be honest, maybe like five, um, because Rooster Teeth, Griff, all have a PMS clan. I am a huge Xbox gamer, so most of my friends who are willing to retweet about my study are also Xbox gamers. So I'd probably say at least 90% of our sample were Xbox gamers. So there wasn't a lot there to do console-wise. Um, do you want to handle the RPG? Or the, the second part of that question about the analysis we did on shooter versus non-shooter? Um, what exactly about shooter versus non-shooter? <laughs> well, um, you said that uh, shooters didn't really show any difference, while non-shooters had a slight increase in... Uh, like, I think in state anger? anger? Oh, yeah. like shooters went down in anxiety, and uh, non-shooters went up in state anger. Yeah. Um, could you go more into that, but maybe... Like, I play strategy games, like Victoria uh -huh. 2. Yeah! There you go! <laughs> I play strategy games. I didn't know this too, sorry. <laughs> um, so, do maybe strategy games have a different effect? Maybe racing games or something like that? Or is it just in general, non shooters have a slight increase in temporary anger? Um, that was one of the situations where we couldn't uh, slice the data set that thinly, or we would have, you know, not, we would have only been able to find really powerful effects. And I did actually, because I also love strategy games, I did take a look at that. And there wasn't anything that was reliable or strong enough to really talk about. So, so it doesn't mean it's not out there. It just means we didn't have the data set necessary to, to take a look at it. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time to uh, answer some part questions. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I guess I have a two part question. I'll try to try to the best way I can. The okay. first part would be um, uh, third person shooters, oh, third person games versus uh, first person games. Mm -hmm. Do you guys ever uh, uh, in your studies consider the idea of uh, different levels of emerging of actually 
seeing your character and playing with that character and living that best sort of character in your college versus kind of just seeing hands and kind of, you know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Did you guys ever uh, stumble across that through your studies or anything like that? I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, there's this whole idea about immersion, and there's like some key things that need for you to become immersed and to lose track of time and things like that. You know, first person, third person does have an effect on that. That was just kind of outside the bounds of what we were really able to to do at this point. Um, again, most of the shooters were Halo and COD, um, so. It, you know, we didn't have the best balance of games played necessarily to, again, to be able to kind of slice the data and look at it like that. Okay, and the second part of that question would be uh, specifically on uh, multiplayer uh, Call of Duties or Halos. Uh, uh, the, I'm not a big fan of multiplayer game, and uh, I noticed that uh, a little cousin, he played multiplayer, and watching him play uh, a couple of times, I noticed that it's the same issues over and over and over, and a lot of people appreciate that and like that. Uh, more disrespect, but I just felt like, wait, you do the same thing 50, 100, 200 times within like two, three hours, and I was just wondering if that's, uh, it's definitely not beneficial to your brain, but if there's anything bad that comes with it, or it's just, that's not really bad kind of a thing. So just to make sure I understand, he's kind of had like a repetitive behavior, he just does one thing in the game over and over yeah. again, like grinding yeah, and like wow? Like, okay. Like, okay. okay. Yeah, of course, the actual game, Capture the Flag, is the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I hope not, because, um, like, Checkers is like that, too. <laughs> I mean, I, I play an online sports game within a first-person shooter called Griffball, and, yeah, all five of us, and uh, we swing the hammer over and over, and I've been playing for five years. So, it's as long as you're still enjoying it. I mean, we do repetitive behaviors, all, we eat every day. There's things that we do all the time that are just over and over again. And as long as he's still getting enjoyment out of it, it's not becoming frustrating or something like he feels like he can't step away from. I, I think it's, as long as it's still enjoyable for him and it's not being negatively affecting, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, your concern is admirable, though. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely respect that. He's your nephew. Yeah, care take care of him. I think he's fine. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, you guys have touched on this a bit, I guess, to the questions. Um, with the games you played, uh, was it more focused on multiplayer as opposed to single player? Uh, I personally feel like single player games can be a little more calming and multiplayer is a lot more amped up, working with people, mm -hmm. competitive. The tough thing about that is when someone reported that they played Halo, I have no idea whether they're in multiplayer, if they're in campaign, if they're in Forge. So we couldn't really look at that. So even if you have a game like Halo where you can play single, you, know, you could do campaign solo legendary if you're suicidal and you wanted to do that, but you know versus something like Fallout Three, you know, which is just a single player game. Um, so we couldn't really break that down necessarily because you can't tell what people are playing when they're playing a game that has the multiplayer option on it. Um, we did do something. Um, we did look at it a little bit, but we didn't see any impacts. Yeah. I feel so like we're disappointing them because <laughs> we didn't find anything bad. You guys just aren't crazy enough. I know. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm from a different group that is often self, that is often identified as being socially anxious, addictive behaviors, loners, which are artists. Oh, welcome. <laughs> and I'm married to a gamer. And so that's why I'm here. And one of the things I thought was interesting when you were talking about getting lost in the game is it made me think of the desired state and art making of getting into flow. Flow, yeah. Is it the same? It can be. I mean, there's some that that loss of time. Um, it can. De it definitely happens in games. I think we've all probably experienced it. And it that can happen one either because you are just not being cognitively aware, or it can be happening because you've entered flow. You've hit such this perfect stride of being challenged right on the edge of your ability, but able to overcome that challenge every single time that you feel like you've mastered it, and it's a sense of, of fulfilling and mastery, which is what flow is, just in case anybody wasn't aware. Um, so sometimes it can be, especially with um, professionals, because flow is something that takes a long time to master. You know, it's not, but video games, I'm trying to remember who it was, someone wrote an entire article about flow in video game. I think it was, Jane McGonigal writes about it, I don't know if she originated it or if she researched it, but it's in her book, Reality is Broken. There's an entire section 
on flow. And she talks about how video games allow you to enter that state much more easily than, say, you know, a pro football player who's trained all his life to get into the zone for that one Victor Cruz catch on the helmet. Go Giants. Um, woo! I know. Let's see that expressive anger now. So, um, I, if you haven't read her book, I would encourage it because there is a chapter on flow in there. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of hard to tell. You know, are you just losing track of time or are you in flow? It's yeah, not easy to tell. Exactly. Exactly. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just is it? Yeah. One of the really quick ones that I'm sure you have an answer for. You said you had a great data pool. How big was your data pool? Okay. Um, let's see. For time one, it was 365, and time two, it was close to 100. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So you mentioned the term getting lost a lot. Do you have a solid definition for that? Because I've spent maybe two or three hundred hours on three different Skyrim cities. No. <laughs> Who hasn't? But I, I, but all, I can't talk. All while being completely aware of the time, so I was wondering what your definition for that was. Um, a lot of it was we would ask people um, different questions pertaining to getting lost and getting lost. Um, we did try, we wanted to get it flow, and the questions aren't gelling in a way that um, statistically works that I like, that I'm comfortable with. Um, the negative aspect of flow, those did come together and those gelled. And those are kind of um, questions pertaining to you know, did you get lost? Um, and also questions getting at, you know, did you get lost in a way that had consequences for you know work, family, and life. So the positive aspect of flow is something we really wanted to pull out and we weren't able to. The negative, we unfortunately were really able to pull out. So. I was also wondering if uh, that had any basis on just uh, just on how good the game is or how much depth there is in the game. I mean, yeah, how, how you get into a game depends a lot on how the game's built and how the game's designed. Um, I had a really tiny little study in my undergrad when I was first getting started where we looked at um, whether game design and controller function imp impacted how people felt after the game. So for example, we had a play, uh, played an M-rated game like Halo, and we had a T for game which was Lost Planet, and then there was an E game, I think it was like Lego Star Wars or something like that. And based on the literature, you know, you would imagine that the more violent the game gets, the more angry you would get. But what we found is that level design, the biggest complaint people had when they got angry was that level design, enjoyment of the game, and controller setup was what led to the anger, not the violence, not the amount of blood. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of how much you enjoy the game will depend on how much you get into it. Sure. All right, we have five minutes. So we will try to move into a lightning round. But if there are people left over, um, we'll be hanging out after the panel, too. So don't fret. You guys use very real games a lot. I'm wondering how to your data about that firm. Do you need to be like covering multiple consoles, or do you need to like have a vested interest as far as like how high of gaming may be interested in gaming team, whether it's esports or developing games? It's a, a term, we didn't operationally define it or anything. It was mostly in comparison to the previous studies that were done where they just took, you know, Psych 101 students who needed extra credit. Or, you know, when they did studies on kids, they just went into elementary schools and saw which parents would sign the consent form. They didn't actually go to the places where gamers live. They didn't go to forums. They didn't go online. They didn't act, interact with them in a place where you could find people who reliably play. And not just once a day, but have been playing for a really long time. So when I said real gamers, I meant people like are in this room. There's not necessarily a, you don't have to meet a, a minimum MLG status, you know, you don't have to be a level 50 or an N7 or anything like that. It's just, do you like playing games? Do you play them? Do you enjoy them? Do you consider yourself a gamer as opposed to a psych 101 student who really needs extra credit? Yeah, and I was going to actually follow up that. So, like, I know you mentioned going to, like, yeah, that's in Bruce Yeah. Finding all these people, there's no, no criteria to anything to say when it's like, we think we are gamers. And you the, have to have an in, because if you don't have an in, no one's going to listen to you. So she was yeah. wonderful in that regard. And, and we, we used Raptor to track, too, because we wanted to get away from people self-reporting. Because you could see people self-report, but that's more coming from 
you know, any pathology than it is from actual experience. So we wanted real data. So. Sure. Hi, sorry Hi. for kind of a long question line around. Um, during my senior year of high school, I wrote a paper on violence in video games. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things that came up uh, that I noticed at least that um, I saw happen in the real world, but there wasn't one study behind it. Is there any sort of is there any correlation between um, violence and um, I used to say like living class, like lower class, upper like middle? Um, a good example would have been um, uh, the Columbine shooting, the one with the old and the, I don't remember the name, when she was bullied a lot, uh -huh. which led to um, the shooting. You know, you play a lot of doom. I play a lot of doom. Mm -hmm. But does, the, does this class have any correlation to violence? You know that at all? I don't know specifically about class, but I do know that um, childhood experiences do. There's an article I just read like two weeks ago about um, Ferguson. Remember our guy? He was on the yeah, right side. Yeah. So, yeah, he um, did a study on whether um, experience to childhood abuse you know, whether it's verbal, physical, or anything like that, influenced whether or not people would express more violent tendencies. And he did it with a forensic population, so he actually could see if they would express um, those violent tendencies. And what he found is that there, when he controlled for that, so when he removed the people who had experienced abuse as children, there was absolutely zero correlation between video game play, violent or otherwise, and acting out aggressively. However, when he reintroduced the... Um, people who have experienced abuse as children, it shot way up. So early experiences and what happens to us as kids and in our environment is what helps shape what we do as adults. And he also went on to say that even though um, video games might shape the way people present that violence, so if you like Grand Theft Auto, you might go run over a prostitute, but <laughs> serious, this is serious, it's me. Uh, it's not going to make it more or less likely at all to happen. So just because you play Doom and this other guy plays Doom, the fact that he had this particular experience growing up it is what's kind of shaped him more than playing Doom, if that makes sense. Right. Uh, the only thing that I really found was that uh, if certain things were in the back beforehand, like instead of use, mm -hmm. I found that instead of doing anything in college, there were other catalysts. I haven't particularly seen catalysts. I've seen more shaping. Like I said, with, with Grand Theft Auto, if you play that, that might be the avenue that your violence takes shape. So they might shape the way you act out, but they don't necessarily, um, I, I haven't found catalysts yet, but I think you're right about early childhood experience shaping and creating the potential that's there. Thank you. Sure. Also, keep in mind over the last, not you in general, but not you in specific, but in general, over the last 30 years, violence, actually, violence rates have been plummeting. Well, I have video a graph game use has been shooting up dramatically. So to make a correlation between the two, you would actually argue that they're beneficial. You had a great question. Yeah, um, I thought it was awesome that you used Raptor for your study. And my question is, what system data did they use prior to that as far as um, when they say that playing games made people violent? Did they know how long people played? Did they just throw that up in the air and get it right? Well, they would ask for self-report. How many hours a day do you think you play? Which, as we've shown, is not a reliable way to assess how long somebody actually played. And they, they just do a lot of self-report. How much do you play? What do you play? That kind of thing. And then for the aggression, they have questionnaires that they would administer the, to people immediately after or about 15 to 30 minutes after they played the violent game. And that's how they assess for aggression. So yeah, it's not very comforting, is it? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. All right, I, do we have time for? All right, one more minute. Lightning round, let's do this. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, I, I work in a lab that does uh, Oh, cool. Um, That's awesome. I, and I just wanted to, uh, another guy I brought up about emerging video games, and that's one of the things that I like to just did a standard that I guess brought Oh, sure, yeah. So if you, if you Google Kenneth Norman Psychology and Emerging, you'll find from the studies on that. Um, and also, uh, the guy who came up with Flo was um, Mahai Chicks at Mahai, and he was really good. My question was, um, uh, you guys talk about how people that seem to be depressed tend to exaggerate um, or misrepresent the type of reality. Mm -hmm. um, like around, do you, do you, do you say a little bit more on that? Because I, I was familiar with the thesis of depressive realism, being that people that are more depressed tend to see them, the world in more kind of negative, realistic terms. Like, you know, what some people call a pessimist, they call themselves a realist. So do you say what um, that meant for the study? 
Sure. Uh, depressive realism is when I look at someone and I realize they don't think I'm that great. So it's kind of a general perception of the current, the now. And also it's kind of a, um, we tend to be generally optimistic and it's kind of uh, more realistic in the sense of, you know, life's going to suck. And life often does suck. Um, we're strong, so that's not a big problem, but um, it is true that life tends to suck. So that's depressive realism. The negative mood state bias is um, if someone's in a negative mood, um, then when they look back, they think, oh, things are always horrible. And then when they look forward, they're like, oh, things are always going to be horrible. So I actually used to do that kind of stuff in the lab, and it was a lot of fun. But um, so there is the depressive realism, which is a phenomenon that happens in some occasions, but there's also a negative mood state, mood state bias that happens in others. So. Yes. I, I think we're at time. So, but just remember, um, we'll hang around here. And I just want to thank everybody um, for coming and supporting us. It was really awesome. Thank you guys all so much.